like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it's written, you should be holy, for I am holy. 1 Peter chapter 1, 14 through 16. And that's who we are as Christians. We have the, the, the privilege to be a holy people. I don't think I would have written that. And I think that's today's reason I know the Bible's not for man. Because I think I might, have been, I might have been tempted to tone down that line. I might have said something like, just be a good person. Or I might have been said something like, oh, just work on becoming a better person. Or I might have said something safe like, well, just be nice. I don't think I would have written, be holy as God is holy. I don't think I would have written that. That's a pretty high standard. I think I might have just left that alone. And yet that's what God had written. Something more than just be a good person. Something more than just work on becoming a better person. And something more than just be nice. Be holy as God is holy. It's a common theme throughout the Bible. Exodus 19.6, a passage we looked at last Sunday morning. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Exodus 22.31, you shall be holy men to me. Leviticus 11.44, and be holy for I am holy. The counterpart of 1 Peter chapter 1. Romans 12, verse 1, it's not just an Old Testament theme. Present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. Ephesians 1, 4, that we should be holy and blameless before him. That's what God is looking for, people that will be holy and blameless before him. Then it says in all your behavior, and if you kind of look at the context of 1 Peter, you'll find that that means all the time everywhere, and if you're looking for specifics, it would be like verse 18, it would be when you're working for someone. Be holy on the job. When you're managing someone, when you're training someone, when you're being trained, be holy. Among sinners, be holy. That's not the easiest thing to do. And that's verse 12. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. While you're, when you're among the sinners, as we often are, be holy. When you're suffering, now this is not an easy one. When you're suffering, be holy too. That's verse 19 of chapter 2. This finds favor that if you bear up under unjust punishment, but with a good attitude, be holy when you're suffering. Be holy in the face of injustice. Be holy when life is not fair. Be holy when you're being mistreated. When you're married, be holy. Chapter 3, verse 7, right? That would be another application of be holy. Honor your mate. Dwell with them in an understanding way. That's not, not, that's not always easy. Be holy in your marriage, in all your behavior. Be holy in your private life, when it's just you and her or you and him at home. Be holy there as well. Verse 8, be holy when you're interacting with your brethren, with other Christians. To sum up, let all be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, humble in spirit. That would be another application of be holy there as well. Let's make some specifics now. Obviously, when you think of holiness, one would be while you're worshiping. In the book of Leviticus, chapter 10, verse 3, those who come near me will treat me as holy. And before all the people, I will be honored. That was the rule that God laid down for the priests. People that would approach God in worship would approach Him with respect. Now, that respect would include, like verse 1, you only offer God what He tells you to offer. You let God set the terms of worship. You let God choose 
what type of music he wants. You let God choose what the elements on the Lord's table are. You let God choose the day of the week that he wants to be worshipped. You let God choose those things. Be alert. Verse 9 of chapter 10 is, don't be drinking. Don't be drinking. And I think the application there is, don't be intoxicated when you show up to worship. Be alert when you worship. Have your wits all about you when you come to worship. And offer worship that is worthy of such a God. Going back to that verse we looked at, before all the people, I will be honored. I will be honored. Offer God worship that honors Him. Now that's not the only place it's found. Deuteronomy 17.1 You shall not sacrifice the Lord your God an ox or a sheep which has a blemish or any defect. That's the testament. You offer God a number one, a number one animal. A number one animal. But cursed be the swindler who has a male in his flock and vows it, but sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. Malachi 1.14, the end of that verse I've been impressed with, for I am a great king. I don't know, the more I look at that, I like that verse. For I am a great king. Why? Why give God the best? Why give God an animal without defect? Because he's a great king. Because he deserves that. He's a great king. But that's not just an Old Testament theme. Christians, even though we don't offer animal sacrifices, really are under a very similar rule. Whatever we offer to God... They need to be acceptable, 1 Peter 2.5. To offer up God acceptable sacrifices. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, that would be the same principle, right? Maybe someone who would partake of communion with a defect or a blemish, so to speak. Someone who would not give the Lord's Supper its proper reverence and respect while they're partaking of it shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Isn't that kind of the same thing as that's detestable in the Old Testament? He who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly when it comes to our giving. Isn't that kind of the same principle of don't be offering something blemished? Applications. How focused am I when I come to worship? How focused am I? Do I give God my best attention? What's my level of concentration during communion? What's my level of concentration? Is my mind wandering on different things? I mean, am I in kind of a bad habit of letting that just be my own head time? Or is that, no, I, I need to concentrate upon what this really means and what Jesus did for me. How am I, how am I doing in that area? How about my level of enthusiasm when, when we're singing? Am I excited to sing? Do, do I enjoy singing? I may not be the best singing. I, I wish I was a better singer. I finally figured out why I'm not a musician. Is that musicians have to be detail-oriented. They may be out of control in every a other aspect of their life. But when it comes to the music, they have to be absolutely detail-oriented. And I'm not like that. I'm, I, I, don't, I don't have that sort of real focus that you have to. Let's well, do that for the hundredth time. Let's play that lick for the hundredth time. Let's go over that thing for the hundredth time. I, I, don't have that, I don't have that part of me. It would be nice to be a musician. I'd like to be able to play something and play it well. And I'd like to be able to sing and sing well. But what do we sing with enthusiasm? Colossians 3.16 Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. How's my singing? How's, does the song just start and I kind of jump in or do I get up and... Like, like the song that we stood up and sang right before the lesson, our national anthem. I mean, I mean it, isn't that kind of... If you're going to think of different songs, isn't number nine, Our God is Alive, kind of the national anthem? 
<laughs> among Christians today, sort of. Oh, let's stand up. That's the national anthem there. I mean, that's a rousing song. There's a lot of songs like that. Did I sing it with enthusiasm? Have I been giving God? How about my giving? How's my giving been? Would a, would a visitor consider what I've been doing here worship? Would they look at me and say, that man's worshiping? That woman's worshiping? Does it look like worship? Does it, what are they doing? They're worshiping. Oh, yeah, it looks, looks like worship. I mean, do I look excited? Do, do I look like I'm worshiping a great king? Do I act like it? Or am I just kind of fulfilling a duty that I got, a, I got something here I need to do and get it out of the way? Do I prepare for Bible study for the Bible class period? I want to tell you something. I, I get so many compliments from people that visit here about our classes as far as the level of participation in the class. People will say, Mark, you really need to realize this doesn't happen everywhere. I mean, you guys got participation and I envy the participation you have. Or I'm at the teacher gives up and he lectures and no one hardly says anything and no one's expected to say anything. And I know I get so many compliments from people that visit here that say, you guys get a lot of participation in your adult classes. You'd be commended for that. Maybe you don't participate a whole lot though. But I bet you got something wise to say now and then. If you're someone that really doesn't ever talk or to participate, if you really got something wise to say, you'd do me a favor to raise your hand and, and say it because that's the only way I learn. I mean, I, I, I may have never thought of that point before, that observation before. That really helps me as, as a teacher. That's something to think about because I know you got something smart. You got some really smart things to say. But when I come, am I prepared though? When I, have I done my, have I done my, Lesson? I mean, have I, you know, have I gone through the questions and read the material and stuff like that? I would think that would be one way of showing God respect of that. God, I care so much about your word that what we're going to study this coming Sunday or Wednesday, I've actually prepared myself for it. And, I, and I'm ready to be an eager participant in the class or at least an eager listener in the class. <laughs> I'm excited to come to worship. Psalm 122, verse 1. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I was glad. Do I look forward to the first day of the week? I look forward to getting together with Christians and being with them and singing and, and thinking of God and learning. And... Or do I view it as a grim duty? In the book of Malachi, in Malachi's time, God's people were saying what a, how tiresome it is. That this is a lot of work. This is kind of a tiresome chore never-ending chore, this worship sort of stuff. When it comes to giving, and I, I always look at this, what I gave this morning, was it bountiful? 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. He was so bountifully. I mean, when I put in that check, if I open up says, oh, is that bountiful? That's bountiful. I mean... That's something I'm always looking at. Is, is that bountiful, or is that just a little bit of off the top of the, of the excess? I, I certainly did not give all like the widow, but am I closer to the widow <laughs> than the spiritually people? Where am I at when I kind of gave? I mean, would, you, would, would someone look at it and say, that, that's, that's rather stingy, Mark? Or would they say, that's bountiful? What about our attire when we attend? I know we live in a very casual and relaxed society. I know that. What should we be aiming for as a people of God, as the priests of God? Uh, reverence or, or relaxed? If you knew someone was going to show up this morning, a famous person was going to show up, would you have dressed any differently? If the president was going to pop by and going to worship with us this morning, would you have dressed any differently? And I guess, I think things will be backwards if we would dress better for a man 
than for God. And something, something's not quite right there if we would actually have dressed better for a man than God. You know what I think the answer to that is, the answer to the question on attire, is the men have to decide that. What, what I mean by that, I think the only answer to attire is that the men of each generation, men in their 70s or men in their 60s or 50s or 40s, but it can't just be those men, men in their 30s and their 20s and even men in their teens. I, I think the men kind of have to make the decision of what they want this congregation to be. That is, to, do they want the congregation to be getting gradually more casual in the way we dress when we come to worship? Or do they want, you know, I, I kind of want to keep a standard of where I dress a little differently when I come here. I don't wear this. I don't wear this hardly any time during the week. I don't wear this. When I first started preaching, I wore a tie and a shirt all the time. I'm more relaxed now when I, or I'm more casual now when I come to Billy, and I don't wear a tie and a and uh, a shirt. I wear a dress shirt. I wear slacks, things like that. So I don't wear this. 95% of the week I'm not wearing this. This is one of the few places where I wear it. Or a funeral or a wedding, I would wear it. I don't know. I just, that's kind of my view is that I'm going to dress a little differently for God than what I dress for 80% of the things that I'm, I'm doing. And I think only the men can do that. I, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think one person or whatever, I think the men, I think each generation of men have to kind of decide of the church of my generation, what do I, what do I, what I want the tire looking like? I mean, how, how casual do I want it to get? Or do, or do I want things being a little bit different here? I think only the men can make that call. The women can certainly encourage them and say, you look nice in that. You really look nice in that. I know we live in a very coarse culture. A lot of swearing out there. A lot of bad language out there. All sorts of places. Are we, first of all, are we using language that's like a first cousin to swearing? Polite swearing the euphemisms and the things like that. And I know if you work around it, it's easy to pick it up. It's hard, it's, uh, if you work around people that swear a lot, it's easy for it to get into your vocabulary. Ephesians chapter 5, 3, but do not let immorality or any impurity or greed even be named among you, as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting. I like, I like that verse. It's kind of like God says... No tolerance. I think that's the verse we should be aiming for is I'm going to aim for that in my life. I, I, I'm certainly not going, I'm not going to justify bad language that I say. I'm going to say, I need to stop saying that, whatever. And I'm not just going to tone it down a little bit and go one step to a first cousin of, well, I won't use this word, but I'll use that word. It means the same thing, but it's the polite way of saying the swear word. I'm even going to get rid of that. And I'm just going to try to have very pure language. I'm going to work on that. I'm going to work on that and make that a goal, an ever goal in my life. Because I'm a saint. First Timothy chapter 2 verse 9, the elders wanted me to teach this lesson. This is a requested lesson. Uh, the elders have been approached with not just one person and not just someone old or young, but some people from different age groups um, with some concerns concerning sometimes the modesty in the assembly. This passage says, Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modesty, modestly and discreetly. I think it's interesting that that's in a worship context. If you look at the context there, um, that's in a context of people worshiping. You have like verse 8, want men to pray in every place. You also have verses 11 and 12 where a woman is not to teach or exercise authority over a man. That's like a worship setting. That's like an assembly type of setting. Um, clearly, clearly, we're to be modest. We should be modest all the time, I mean, like when we're out in public and stuff like that, but especially when we come together and worship. 
There's a modesty survey. There are two brothers, Brett, Brett and Alex Harris. They're not members of the Church of Christ, but they have a website. And they had a modesty survey on the website, which I thought was kind of intriguing. They made it very clear that they were not trying to come up with a dress code. What they tried to do is they had all these questions, a number of interesting questions that they posed. They had men, they had men from different age groups, or young men, etc., in your 30s down to your teens and stuff like that. All sorts of questions about, would you consider this distracting if a woman wore it? All sorts of questions like, you know, questions like if a woman wore something that had logo across their chest, does that bring attention to that part of the body? I mean, all sorts of questions like that, you know? If something's written on the bottom of her pants and she's walking around, you know, does that draw attention there? Um, and the purpose of the survey was to kind of help educate, I guess, women as far as what men can find distracting, what, what really doesn't help out there. Um, distracting would mean that you see it and you have to look the other way, you might have to fight some thoughts. Um, and if it's in a worship service, it interferes with worshiping because now you got, you, you got this little battle that you're fighting over here while, while you're trying to worship at the same time. And what it was, they made it clear, we're not trying to make a dress code, what they said was, is that as men were just trying to ask for help, that there are certain things that don't help um, if you wear it. 56, I mean, it was like disagreed, strongly disagree, agree, strongly agree. 50%, 56% of the men polled strongly agreed that uh, exposed cleavage on a woman is a problem, especially if she bends over. I would add something also. It's not just, it's not just the frontal view, it's the side view as well. Sometimes, if you're in a mirror, sometimes you should kind of look and see how it looks from the side because that's sometimes the side that the men might see is like, what, what have I seen out of this blouse or whatever from a side angle? Because that's one angle. 59% said that a dress that is cut, that's cut low only in the back. I mean, it might be all the way up in the front, but if you cut it really low in the back, that's distracting as well. 66 agreed that a strapless dress is very, a very thin strapless dress is distracting. 82% said that shorts that are shorter than mid-thigh are a problem. In fact, about 60% said whatever you're wearing, if whatever you're wearing is when you're just you know, standing straight, if whatever you're wearing is above mid-thigh, whether it's shorts, pants, or whatever, uh, that's tempting to look at. And that, that's distracting as well. 76% said that they were not fans of skin-tight jeans. I, I don't know, it's an interesting survey. You might take a look at it sometime. I think it's called the Revolution. Not Revolution, but Reb, Rebel and then Lucian. Dot com. It, basically, it's a website of getting young men to rebel against, getting kids to rebel against low standards and, and to live by a higher standard. A lot of just kind of interesting questions. And not everybody on there was, yeah, that's a problem, that's a problem, that's a problem. A lot of guys said, no, no, that's not an issue. No, no, that's... Because they had all sorts of questions about how things were cut, how clothes were put together, how they were tied together, where they were tight, where they were loose, all sorts of questions like that. Men face, here's what men face, uh, especially in the summer, an onslaught of immodesty. I like going to summer events, I like going to festivals, I like going to Washington County uh, Fair, it's free. I know though when I go out there, it's going to be an immodesty festival <laughs> at, the, at the same time, at the same time. I, I, I already know what I'm up against when I, when I go there. Uh, and we get it everywhere. We, we get it on television, we get it in movies, we get it in magazines at the checkout counter, we, we get it everywhere. We get it in ads. We get it in ads. I, I, I don't understand, I just don't understand as a man why we, I need to pick, uh, why Sears needs to show women in their underwear. I, I just don't, get, like, well, I wonder what that looks like. Uh, why can't you just show the item without anybody in it? So I, I just don't, you know, I mean, 
nobody here would be di like, hey, this, this, here, let's take your picture. When you get ready in the morning and put it there in the Sears ad, no way, no way. And yet we think that's kind of like, oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's just a woman in her underwear. Well, why don't you be in your underwear and get your picture taken? Oh, not me. An onslaught of on campus and the workplace when recreating, when vacationing. I love the water. I love the water. I like swimming holes. I like to swim. I'd love to be out in a lake in a boat and a jet ski, wave runner. I love that. But I also know what's also out there at the same time. The assembly should it be, should it be at least one place where a man can kind of say, at least here I get a reprieve. I get a reprieve here in the assembly. I want to give some help to men, though. Because, and I think, you know what? I think the women here really are very conscientious and try very hard. And I, and I, th I think we have a great group of women here and young ladies. There have just been some comments that it looks like here and there that maybe there have been a little bit of relaxing the standard. That's a hard thing for an elder. That's a hard thing for an elder as far as what to do about that. Do you, do you, do you confront the person? Do you, who was it? Do you pull them aside? Or do you at least, I think the elders have said, well, let's just kind of give a lesson on this to kind of give people a little bit of, not warning, but be aware of this. We don't want to embarrass anybody. Okay. We don't. And so maybe more of a kinder way to kind of for all of us to think about it. But you know what? As a man, and I'm going to talk to the man here and the young men, uh, no matter how Christian women dress, the reality is that the world is not going to give you a break ever for the rest of your life. All right? And what I wanted to say here is that being interested in the opposite sex is a good, healthy thing. Never resent that. Never resent, never resent the way that God wired you together. You know, that... I like women, I'd like to get married, etc. Good, that's a healthy thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 7, I wish that all men were even as I myself. However, each man has his own gift from God. That is, that's a gift from God. Your interest in the opposite sex is a gift from God. Never resent that. Do not get angry at women, and do not get angry at women in general. You know, most men have kind of caved into all this. And said, so, hey, no harm looking, and it's summertime, and at least Christian men are about the only group, one of the few groups of men I know out there that are still putting up a fight and saying, I'm not going to cave in. I'm not going to buy into this attitude of, hey, I can look as much as I want. I can oogle, you know, I can think whatever I want. At least Christian men are trying to put up a fight and say, I'm, I, I'm in a battle for my mind and my thoughts, and I am not going to settle for a very low standard. And you know what? There's something, I think, very romantic about a man who battles like that. A, a man who says, I'm going to seek to control my head. Very noble about a man like that. Because a man, a man chooses to love rather than being led away. A man chooses to love rather than lust. Men don't follow, they lead. Proverbs chapter 7, verse 22, I always think of that young man who follows the, the adulteress in that passage, and he's a follower, he's not a leader. He's allowing himself to be seduced. He's not putting up a fight. Suddenly he follows her as an ox goes to slaughter, as one in fetters to the discipline of a fool. Not very masculine. Not the very masculine sounding that he, here this man follows her as an ox to slaughter. That doesn't sound very manly. It sounds pretty weak. And I think that's something to understand about a man. A man leads. A man doesn't follow. A man is not out there saying, hey, entice me, seduce me. No, no. Don't be out there as a man sneaking peeks or oogling or whatever. Be bold with the gospel. Be bold with the gospel. Put the emphasis there. Be bold. Don't be sneaky, be bold. 
with the truth. Choose to look at interesting people, not a modest people. Sometimes I'll do that. I, I like the people watch. I really do, because there's some really interesting people out there. And sometimes it's the guy with the small head, like, Man, that guy really has a small head. But then there's the guy with the big head. That's a big head that guy has. Or it could be the guy whose head is like a perfect circle. That is a perfect, that is, that is quite the, or whatever it may be, you know. I mean, there's just a lot of interesting people out there to look at. Or how they interact or something like that. To young men, I would say refuse to play the game. I'm not going to play the game. I know there are some women out there in the world that maybe don't know any better. And so I, I seek to give them a rake. But there might be some that are trying to get just somebody's attention. And I think as a man, you have to say, I'm not going to play this game of look at me, I'm looking, and I walk away, I got someone's, I'm not playing that game. I'm, I'm not going to look. I, I'm, I will, if, I, if I see something coming out of the corner of my eye, Red alert, the little man in my head goes, red alert. I'm not, well, not going to look. I, I think Proverbs chapter 6, verse 25, do not desire her beauty in your heart. I'm not going to look. Oh, not looking at that. Go look over here. I, I'm not going to give it the attention because it doesn't deserve attention. And I'm not going to play the game. I'm not going to play this game. And I think a lot of men would say the game is a pretty frustrating game. And it's no fun. It's really no fun. And I think, you know, tired of doing that, tired of that, did that when I was a non-Christian, and it was a very frustrating thing, not going to play that game anymore. Be a man that's hard to get. That is, I think, be a man that says, if you're going to get my attention, that's not going to get the attention. I'm looking deeper than that. I'm not impressed by that. Something else impresses me. Character impresses me. What you say impresses me. Saying something smart impresses me. Being a woman of virtue impresses me. But that's what impresses me. Fill your life with things to do. Be a man of action. And realize what really matters or what a real accomplishment is. And understand the real price. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 22. A ring of gold and a swine stout, so is a beautiful woman who lacks discretion. I don't know. I wish I'd, I wish I, I think a lot of men said, I wish they'd woken up this years later in high school because, you know, a lot of us when we were in high school, there were typically this that girl or that girl that dressed a certain way that, you know, and everyone said, oh, if I could just get a date with her or whatever, okay? And I think I'm married to someone very beautiful. I wouldn't want anybody else. But to the young men, to the young men in high school that maybe see that person out there that's putting all the emphasis on the outside, okay, after 50 years, okay, here's, here's the look from the other perspective. That is, often understands, uh, for understand what goes with the modesty. For the men, understand, understand what often goes with the woman who's putting all the emphasis on the outside. And that is drama, selfishness, expensive, high maintenance. That kind of helps me as a married man today when you're somewhere and here, and here comes Wampa 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 walking through. Okay, that's what I'll just call it. Wampa Wampa Wampa's walking through. Okay. And I'm going, trouble, trouble. I'm glad I didn't marry that. Trouble. You know, I was, I was, I was in arguments and fights, and the beauty will fade. I think, as I was thinking about this lesson, I was thinking, I don't know how many places this lesson could be preached. You know, I think there's probably a number of churches that, no, no, that's, that's trouble, that's going to... I think, it's a compliment, I think it's a compliment to the congregation here that we can actually talk about things like this. 
I don't know, to me, to me, that tells me, I think I'm with a group of real Christians. I think I'm a group of people that are walking the walk and not just talking. Well, we can actually have candid discussions about topics like this. And I think that indicates maturity, spirituality, and that we're doing, and that we're succeeding in what we're doing. There, there, are, there are a number of churches out there that are trying, that are really trying. I know Witt said, Witt said every May, every May where he's at, the preacher has a lesson on modesty he brings out before summer hits. Or in the spring. I think back in uh, Georgia, summer hits about the end of February or whatever. But sometime early in the spring when it starts hitting, you know, there's less. And then there are a number of churches that are trying what they can do. I appreciate your attention this morning. There may be here, one here who's not a Christian. Christianity does bring you to a higher standard. I just want to tell you, I'm glad that years ago I opted for the higher standard. That has done me a lot of good as a person. That's brought me a lot of happiness. It's brought me a lot of self-worth. It's brought me a lot of good things to opt for the higher standard where God wants me to be. I do not regret that decision of opting for that. To become a Christian, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. If you're considering doing that, talk to myself or one of the members here. Let's be standing and singing the invitation song.